A better villain, however, is the previously mentioned Count Dooku. Despite the name, I actually really like Dooku. It helps that he's played by Christopher Lee, and while Samuel L. Jackson is wasted as Mace Windu since he never really has any cool lines or badass moments and his performance is so restrained, Christopher Lee slips into a villain role like this just so damn easily. His dialogue might not be anything to write home about, but he's friggin' Dracula and Saruman. The man knew how to squeeze an entertaining performance out of even the clunkiest lines. Now is the time, my friends. This is the moment when you have to decide between the Republic or the Confederacy of Independent Systems. A thousand more systems will rally to our cause with your support, gentlemen. And let me remind you of our absolute commitment to capitalism. You know, we like to joke about how Star Trek's Federation is a communist utopia, but here's Star Wars just outright saying, the bad guys are devoted to capitalism. Strangely, this meeting scene has different aliens in it than in the movie. I wonder if they didn't have the design elements finished when they started working on this. Oh, and the comic's dialogue actually includes more specific mentions of trade stuff. Reduced tariffs, abolition of all trade barriers, and the treaty's purpose is all about profit. I'm guessing this got cut after the initial why was the first movie about trade negotiations thing. Anyway, point is, Obi-Wan overhears them planning to openly oppose the Republic and force them to concede to all their demands. Meanwhile, Anakin is tracked down Shmi to a Tusken Raider camp and breaks into a hut to free her, but by the time she's untied, she only has enough time to recognize him and say she's proud of him before she dies. Probably from a combination of torture, dehydration, starvation, and God knows what else. Well, it's a good thing that the Jedi taught him to manage his emotions so well. So anyway, he proceeds to murder all the Tusken Raiders. Obi-Wan's signal isn't strong enough to reach Coruscant, so he tries to contact Anakin to relay the transmission to the Jedi Council. Speaking of, he returns to the moisture farm with Shmi's body. Later, he's in the farm talking with Padme about it. The scene is... not great. It definitely shows off that Christensen was not a bad choice for this and allows him to let loose a bit on his acting, but I'll explain my issue in a minute. He rants to Padme that he should have been able to save her, but when Padme mentions that he's not all-powerful, he says he should be. I promise you, I will even learn to stop people from dying. Eh, foreshadowing for the next movie, but clunky line. Then he starts blaming Obi-Wan, claiming he's jealous of his power before admitting he didn't just kill the armed members of the Tusken Raiders, but all their families, too. Even the children. From there, he moves into saying he shouldn't be feeling this way, that he should have been able to control himself as a Jedi, and he screams that he's sorry about it. It's not a bad scene. It's just it could have been so much better. The problem is a combination of the wrong dialogue with the wrong circumstances. Killing Anakin's mother like this in story makes sense. In fact, when I was a kid and first watched The Phantom Menace, I guessed that losing his mother would be the thing that got him to turn over to the dark side. But let me suggest an alternate way this plays out. He blames Obi-Wan for being jealous and holding him back, but that gets discarded right away. What he should be doing here is saying, this is the Jedi's fault. If they had let me go to her when I was first sensing this, I could have saved her. And even when he gets there, maybe he does get to her in time, but the raiders start shooting. Anakin tries to fend them off, but he's not powerful enough to take on so many and defend his mother. Maybe he pulls a Kylo Ren and stops a bunch of their blaster bolts in midair, but he can't stop them all and his mother gets killed. Otherwise, him proclaiming, I will be the most powerful Jedi ever, doesn't really make sense because lacking power is not what got her killed. Consider this. Instead of yelling that, he stares down at his lightsaber or his hands and just whispers to himself, I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't powerful enough. I need to be more powerful. And then his cold, angry eyes just go up and there's a dark shadow over his face. In the original trilogy, Darth Vader is always pontificating on the power of the dark side, but in the prequels, Anakin never actually pursues power. He just crosses out light side on his character sheet and changes it to dark side. Part of the problem is that they decided he should be automatically super powerful right from the start. So we never see him trying to become more powerful, except by vague allusions to new powers in the third movie. Which, of course, we'll get to next week. Instead, this scene is him rambling and ranting in his grief. And that's fine. It's not a bad thing. 
It's just it could have been used in a way that better put him on the path to become Vader. He's still a good guy here, so this is more just the good guy going through hardship and some conflicting morality and emotional vulnerability. That's a good thing. I don't object to that. I just don't feel it works with where the prequels should be at this point as prequels to the original trilogy. In my opinion, and you're of course free to disagree with me on this, this movie should have ended with Anakin becoming Darth Vader. Not necessarily in the armor, but by the end, he should have officially sworn his allegiance to Sidious and the Dark Side, with Episode 3 serving as him secretly enacting the plan that would bring down the Jedi. This should be the turning point for him. All that build-up in the first half of the movie was his constant resentment of the Jedi and their methods, of Obi-Wan holding him back, teasing his more fascistic beliefs and tendencies, and now all of that gets shoved by the wayside until the next movie. Seriously, all that stuff that puts him on the path to the dark side? Completely irrelevant for the rest of Attack of the Clones. And there are apparently a few years between episodes 2 and 3, so in reality, a ton of time passes before his journey to become Darth Vader becomes important again. Anyway, Obi-Wan connects with Anakin's ship and they retransmit the message, explaining the Viceroy being behind the assassination attempts and that different factions are pledging their armies to Count Dooku. However, Obi-Wan's then captured by battle droids. Mace Windu orders Anakin to stay put and keep protecting Padme while he dispatches Jedi to rescue Obi-Wan. However, after the call is over, Padme says that they probably won't get to him in time, so elects to go and rescue him. Back on Coruscant, the Jedi talk with the Chancellor and some Senators about the situation. Only 200 Jedi are available to be sent in to help Obi-Wan, and the Separatists are clearly massing for war anyway, so they need the clone army. Problem is, it's clear the Senate will not approve the use of the clones before the Separatists attack. The Chancellor is... adjutant? Prime Minister? I don't know who the hell the Blue Devil guy actually is, but he's, like, an important dude, and he says the way to push past the red tape is if the Senate granted the Chancellor emergency powers to approve the use of them straight away. I love how everyone's all, Oh sweet, someone ordered clones for us before we had to! Nothing weird or suspicious about that! Let's just use them without truly understanding how this happened, even though the guy who was the template for them apparently works for the Separatists! Yeah, that's a weird thing too. No one in the movie ever really speculates about why, if Jango Fett is the basis for the Republic's clone army, he's working for the enemy! Sure, he was just paid to use his DNA and stuff, but he's clearly still working with the Kaminoans, and that doesn't raise a few eyebrows? Anyway, they wonder who would actually propose such a radical amendment, Blue Devil Guy saying, If only Senator Amidala was here. She'd totally do that. Even though, no, she seemed pretty adamant not to do so. But we'll talk more about that next week. No, it's Jar Jar who steps up to the plate and says he'll do it. And by the way, this is the first time he's shown up in the comic at all. I think it's pretty clear the creators on this one didn't like him and just left him out entirely until they had to bring him in. Jar Jar gets blamed for the creation of the Empire, both in and out of universe, and that's a bit unfair. There's no way he could have known this would happen. Back over to Geonosis, we get our first proper scene with Count Dooku as he talks with Obi-Wan. It's... a curious scene at that. We learn that he was actually Qui-Gon's master, even him saying he wishes Qui-Gon was still around to help with what he's doing here. You see, Dooku denies being in charge or that Jango is here. The interesting thing is that he freely admits that the Republic is under the control of the Sith. Obi-Wan doesn't buy it, saying the Jedi would have sensed it. The dark side of the Force has clouded their vision, my friend. Hundreds of senators are now under the influence of a Sith Lord called Darth Sidious. It's one of the things that makes Dooku such a fascinating villain here. What is actually served by giving Obi-Wan so much information? Sowing distrust, sure, but being so specific with who the villain is? And is he just trying to manipulate him by planting the seeds of doubt in the Senate, or does he genuinely want Obi-Wan to join him and then hope to turn him to the dark side? This is one of those things I'm okay with not really knowing the full details of his intentions for. It's just very fun to speculate. After leaving, Anakin and Padme arrive and start looking around. Padme wants him to follow her lead, hoping she can try to find a diplomatic solution to all this. 3PO apparently came along. I guess now with Shmi dead, he's not going to be any help to the family who technically owned him now. Or they just wanted to get rid of him. He is comic relief after all. And he goes along with R2 so they can indeed be some comic relief. This leads to the droid factory scene, which... 
Yeah, it kind of sucks. It's a very over-the-top action scene and feels like they should be killed ten times over during it. There's just so much stuff, it's so busy. And in the end, it's ultimately pointless, except for comic relief for 3PO, since they just get captured in the end anyway. Oh wait, it does serve one other purpose. Establishing that R2 apparently had jets that he could fly with, and then never uses again in the original trilogy. Also, I'm pretty sure he tries to murder 3PO. I'm not against an action scene here, since it's been a bit, but it's just so ridiculous, and we're about to get the start of a much better set of action scenes anyway. We then get a deleted scene, one that probably should have stayed in. It shows Padme actually trying to negotiate with Dooku and failing, with him encouraging her to get Naboo to join the Separatists. Aren't you fed up with the corruption? Aren't you? Be honest, Senator. The ideals are still alive, Count, even if the institution is failing. You believe in the same ideals we believe in! If what you say is true, you should stay in the Republic and help Chancellor Palpatine put things right. The Chancellor means well, m'lady, but he is incompetent. Somewhere, Sidious just raised his head up and realized, Oh, someone's going to get his ass shocked with lightning next time I see him. Following this, Jar Jar gets the emergency powers granted to Palpatine, who swears to give them up once the crisis is over, first declaring to create an army for the Republic. In the meantime, Yoda says he'll check out Kamino, while Mace Windu says he'll take the Jedi they have to rescue Obi-Wan. Wait, they haven't left yet? No wonder Padme said you wouldn't get there in time! Get off your lazy asses already! Next is a cutscene that was a good cut because it's just unnecessary. The Geonosian leader declaring that Anakin and Padme are guilty of espionage and will be put to death. The two are brought to a cart where they'll be executed in a goofy, over-the-top manner, but we'll get to that in a minute. Anakin tells her not to be afraid. I'm not afraid to die. I've been dying a little bit each day since you came back into my life. Okay, she means that romantically, but really it sounds like she's just utterly sick of him. She admits her love for him, and they kiss before being brought out. The two, along with Obi-Wan, are tied to stone pillars in the middle of an arena, and a bunch of monsters are going to be brought out to kill them, because apparently public executions are no fun unless done by a giant praying mantis. Also, Padme apparently learned lockpicking in her free time as queen, since she uses a hairpin to undo her cuffs. They fight the monsters for a bit, with Anakin ultimately using the Force to tame one and ride it like a steed for the three to escape. Naturally, the people in charge aren't going to let them get away, Way, until the Jedi arrive, Mace Windu putting his purple lightsaber up to Jango Fett's neck so he doesn't help. And I guess Yoda was being a little optimistic in his assessment, since the narration says it's only a hundred Jedi who show up to the rescue. And thus, fight scene ensues, with battle droids and Geonosians emerging out of everywhere to fight. And pretty much it's all fight scenes until the end, but they're at least halfway decent ones. For starters, this is the first time we ever saw this many Jedi engaged in combat at once. Admittedly, it's so chaotic that it's hard to follow, but like the fight with Darth Maul last time, it's at least a spectacle to behold. Unfortunately, this also leads to a few stupid moments. For starters, there's Jango Fett. In the movie, he manages to kill a Jedi who climbs up to attack Dooku, but he doesn't even get that here. No, in both movie and comic, he leaps down into the fray! Why did you do that? You have no reason to go down there! You were fine! There is no reason to just jump down and give up your strategically advantageous position high above them to go right down to where people are shooting and slicing and there are rhino dinosaurs running around! I know we make fun of Eye of the High Ground, but in fact the high ground is a good thing to have! Especially for Jango Fett, who uses ranged weapons! But no, instead he gets knocked around right before Mace Windu chops his head off. Eventually, the remaining Jedi, yeah, a bunch get killed, get pushed into a circle and Dooku offers them the chance to surrender. They, of course, refuse. However, the rescuers are now themselves rescued by Yoda, who has brought the clones. The sky is unexpectedly filled with a squadron of Republic gunships which descend into the arena. There is something twistedly beautiful about seeing this scene and going, YAY! THE STORMTROOPERS ARE HERE! While Yoda directs the clone troopers in battle against the retreating Federation forces, we get a scene of Boba Fett cradling the decapitated head of Jango, which seems like it should have been setting something up for Revenge of the Sith, but nope, that gets followed up in the Clone Wars cartoon. It's also just kind of weird to see this little kid holding a decapitated, if helmeted, head like this. 
Anyway, Star Wars stuff happens as Anakin, Padme, and Obi-Wan pursue Count Dooku, who, like Darth Maul before him, is trying to maintain his dignity while flying a Scooty Puff Jr. Is that just the official Sith vehicle? Because these ships have never heard of doors, or seatbelts, it gets rocked and Padme falls out of it onto the sand. Anakin wants to land a retriever, but Obi-Wan convinces him to stop since he needs his help to take down Dooku, and Padme would want to keep going. This is what I mean about how his development towards Darth Vader is on hold. Admittedly, they do need more scenes of them being friends for it to match with Obi-Wan's description of him to Luke, since otherwise he'd go, Oh yes, Anakin was a petulant apprentice of mine. What a dick. But he just starts obeying Obi-Wan again and following the Jedi ideals here. It's like nothing has actually changed for him. Anyway, it's not shown, but in the movie, the clone trooper ship is destroyed after letting Anakin and Obi-Wan off to confront Dooku. Anakin recklessly charges in first and gets zapped with force lightning for his trouble. As you can see, my Jedi powers are far beyond yours. Wait, shooting lightning is a Jedi power? Why did anybody tell me? Obi-Wan is unimpressed. I don't think so. Between this and the next movie, was that supposed to be Obi-Wan's catchphrase? Dooku is able to outfight Obi-Wan and injure him, knocking him out of the fight. Anakin gets back up and engages as well. You have unusual powers, young Padawan, but not enough to save you this time. Are they ever gonna get around to explaining just what these unusual special powers are at some point? Like, he can use the force to make scrambled eggs in a cold pan? What are they? Anakin even dual wields lightsabers against Dooku, but it's not enough. I already explained last time a disappointment with the more acrobatic fights of the prequels, but I'm actually okay with this fight against him. It's not perfect, but it's definitely more restrained than others, helped by the fact that that's actually Christopher Lee doing a lot of the swordplay. Not in the wide shots, but in closer shots, yes. In terms of fight choreography, it's nothing special, especially as the final boss battle of the movie, but that's because it's more of a warm-up for what's to come. Anyway, the fight is soon lost, and Anakin's hand gets cut off. Oof, he's good at this. You gotta hand it to him. <laughs> eh, comic doesn't do a good job of showing it. It honestly looks more like Dooku just grazed the back of his lower arm. Dooku prepares to kill him, but then Yoda arrives. The comic leaves out how in the movie they try to use other force powers on each other first. Like Yoda redirecting his lightning back, or Dooku trying to collapse rocks on him, and just move straight into the lightsaber. Oh my god, look at this artwork! He's just waving it in front of his face! What the hell is this? Sweet merciful crap, it's not just one panel either! Look at this, they're just waving their lightsabers up and down or left and right! You know, there's a strong argument against this scene, and I admit, I'm conflicted about it myself. But then here comes the comic adaptation to remind you, there's always a stupider idea! What's he gonna do next? Force pull over another lightsaber so it's in stereo? Size matters not, Master Yoda. Not compared to the power of the windmill! Eventually, Yoda starts doing more intense attacks. Not quite in the same way it's presented in the movie, but here, Dooku also- <laughs> Oh my god! He does grab Anakin's saber so he can dual wield to try to counter Yoda! I was kidding! So yeah, Yoda, that tiny little dude who's always walking around with a cane, can actually flip around and jump like he was in the Matrix. I serve my energy for moments like this. I'm of two minds about this. Yes, it is cool to see Yoda doing this stuff. I may not like the more acrobatic fights of the prequels, but I get it. The Jedi at the height of their powers and abilities, and it's amazing to behold. My problem is that it seems to be at odds with how Yoda and the Force are supposed to be. This is my problem with that whole, this weapon is your life thing, or Yoda teaching lightsaber tactics at the academy to little kids. Yoda's entire point in Empire Strikes Back is that the Jedi are not about the fighting. While they will engage in combat for freedom and justice in the name of the moon and all, their knowledge and understanding of the Force is through inner peace, harmony, serenity. Dooku says their conflict can't be resolved through mastery of the Force, but with their skills with a lightsaber, except a Jedi's mastery of the Force is not about lifting rocks. I'm looking for a great warrior. Force not to make one great. <laughs> so making Yoda engage in a very physical duel like this, making him be the one who's teaching lightsaber fighting, and having Obi-Wan say, this weapon is your life, feels counter to his teachings. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. Although, I admit, him sitting and meditating to defeat Dooku wouldn't exactly make for good cinema. 
I don't know, I just feel like there was a middle ground between that and here's a fan service shot of Yoda being cool. Like, here's an idea. Maybe Dooku is the one who's constantly attacking with his lightsaber, but Yoda is so strong with the Force that he's constantly dodging. He's still as acrobatic as this, but he never actually makes an attack. Or like, he has so strong with the Force, every time Dooku tries to attack, he can telekinetically stop it. Realizing how screwed he is, Dooku suspends a big piece of machinery over the defeated Anakin and Obi-Wan, forcing Yoda to turn his attention towards helping them instead of fighting. Mind you, I would have taken advantage of the distraction to slice Yoda down, but whatever. He makes his escape. Dooku secretly makes his way to Coruscant and meets with Darth Sidious, who reveals his Sith name of Lord Tyrannus. Which, by the way, is a much cooler name than Count Dooku. Oh my god, I just realized, is it possible that calling him Count, and with the hard D and K sounds, it's actually supposed to be a reference to Count Dracula? He also reveals that he's in on the plan to start this war. Later, at the Jedi Temple, Obi-Wan discusses with Mace Windu and Yoda Dooku's accusations about the Senate. Since the dark side is all about deception and lies, they can't really trust what he's saying, but then again, lies are best hidden with a sprinkle of truth, so they're gonna keep a closer eye on the Senate. Obi-Wan says they were victorious this day, but Yoda has to be a party pooper. This is not a victory, for the Clone War has now started. Shouldn't this technically be called the Separatist War? Why are you naming the war after what your troops are? Are. Begun. The Clone War has. At least Corday didn't live to see this. This is a great scene in the movie. The Imperial March slowly playing over the clone troopers being loaded onto proto star destroyers. It truly hints at how bad this actually is. And so our comic ends on Naboo, where Padme and Anakin, now equipped with a robot hand, are getting married in secret. And of course, the one time it'd be appropriate for Padme to wear something ridiculously showy. She's actually pretty low-key. This movie is still bad, and actually, unlike last time, I think the comic is kind of bad, too. As an adaptation, it replicates most of the movie pretty well, but this one has a lot more artistic issues than last time. A lot more wonky faces and bizarre motions. There are spots, like the early chase through Coruscant, where it seems like the comic has a better grasp of what's going on, but then there's just bizarre stuff during action scenes, like the waving lightsaber fight where you just have to wonder what the hell they were thinking. And of course, because it's copying the movie, it yet again contains all the wince-inducing dialogue. The addition of deleted scenes, especially ones that may expand on character, is certainly welcome, but they also include plenty of deleted scenes that were cut for good reason. On the subject of the movie itself, like I said, it is a bad film. While I still think Phantom Menace is worse, if only by virtue of the delivery not being as bad as it was there, the poorly handled romance drags things down considerably. Especially since, in addition to setting up how Anakin becomes Darth Vader, it's supposed to be establishing who Anakin is as a character now to us, since he obviously is not the nine-year-old yelling, Yippee! anymore. And the impression of him is not good, but as a whiny, petulant jerk who doesn't know when to stop hitting on the woman he's supposed to be protecting. Chunks of exposition that would give us a better idea of how things work in this universe are missing, relegated to expanded universe material. The movie is definitely more in love with its effects department than it is in developing the romance. This is the film that really is pushing more of the digital technology that Lucas loved so much. CGI environments everywhere, more poorly integrated CGI characters, and even the clone troopers themselves are all computer generated. Probably for ease of using so many of them in large battle scenes. And speaking of battle scenes, yeah, this movie definitely cares more about the flashy action scenes over anything else. There's still stuff I like, still a foundation for a really good movie if some things have been changed, but overall, it's just the middle chapter of the prequels, and for many, it feels like we're just dragging our way to the end. Also, why is this movie called Attack of the Clones? The clones aren't really the ones on the attack. The Jedi attack. But this is pretty much a defensive action, or at least a rescue mission. Next time, the prequel trilogy concludes with the one that people actually say is the good one. Revenge of the Sith. We'll see if the comic can live up to that boast.
then we decided to come and rescue you. Good job. 